Hello there and a very warm welcome to the European Parliament in Strasbourg. On today's Talking Europe, we're tackling the biggest country in the European Union, associated with a strong economy, reliable cars, a penchant for beer and a seemingly Teflon Chancellor. We are, of course, talking about Germany, the country that's also about to hold federal elections with current Chancellor Angela Merkel looking like the far and away favourite to win a fourth term as Chancellor. Well, joining me here in Strasbourg to get a check on the state of Germany in 2017 and to get a handle on where four more years of Merkel might take it, two German MEPs. Firstly, from Angela Merkel's CDU party, Godeliver Christel de Rovol. Thank you very much for being with us. Yes, and uh, from the SPD Social Democrats of Frau Merkel's uh, contender Martin Schulz, I'm very pleased to welcome Jakob von Weizsäcker. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, when we think about Germany, we do think about uh, stability, perhaps things not changing very fast. And if we look at the polls currently, it does look like Angela Merkel is by far and away the favourite to win four more years. Uh, Mrs. Christel Drovol, if I come to you first, has Angela Merkel got this one in the bag already? No. No? The elections will be finished at the 24th of September at 6 o'clock in the evening. And until then we have to fight uh, to get a majority, to get a very good result for Angela Merkel, for our party. And Mr. von Weizsäcker, uh, your candidate Martin Schulz, he really is lagging behind. Do you also feel like uh, everything could yet change between now and the 24th? Well, a week is a long time in politics, so yes, of course things can change. But what is entirely correct is that currently in the polls, um, Merkel is far ahead. But there's still around a third of the population undecided. Um, so um, I think what Martin Schulz needs to do and what he's trying to do is to uh, make it clear to voters that this is not an election about whether we feel all right in Germany today, but how to build our future. And it's interesting to think that uh, the last time there was a social democratic chancellor, Gerhard Schröder, he did a number of reforms in a very difficult period mm. that um, moved Germany ahead. Also um, it came with some problems and Merkel in her uh, currently 12 years, it benefited enormously from these reforms. And now it's a question of whether we are all right with complacency or whether we think about the future. So progress, that's one po important part of our agenda. And the second important part of our agenda is, of course, there's a certain part of the population that did not benefit mm -hmm. from economic growth, that was left behind. And that's also something we need to deal with as social democrats. If I perhaps bring that back to you, Mrs. Christad Rovol, do you see Angela Merkel as being complacent? No. Well, it is, it is right that Schröder made reforms, but afterwards the Social Democrats were hitting themselves because they didn't want the reforms of Schröder. We found that, they were, that it was the right time to make them and that Schröder had the courage to make them. Okay. The 12 years from Merkel, it was eight years together with the Social Democrats. So uh, they cannot say, no, G Merkel is complacent and uh, there is nothing happening. Uh, they had uh, the possibility to make, to make things happen. And on the other side, the Social Democrats are, uh, said, are always saying in the last four years, everything which uh, was decided came from our initiative. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not so sure it's only their initiative, but they didn't have a majority. Mm -hmm. So they, they needed, in a big coalition, in a, uh, you need the, the two sides of the coalition to work together. OK, well, let's pick up on uh, some of those ideas that we've just been talking about, about uh, those reforms that were made, how the German economy has transformed. I think it's fair to say that at this point, young people feel disproportionately impacted by employment reforms, uh, mini jobs and so on. Uh, Germany actually has twice as many voters aged over 40 as under 40, but many of those young voters say that they do feel they're getting a bit of a raw deal. Uh, we can take a look now at a report prepared by our correspondents in Berlin on this very subject. 
booming growth, a historically low unemployment rate, on paper Germany is doing very well. But behind the great economic success there is also a different reality, that of Thomas. For more than 10 years he has moved between different jobs with no security. He started a mini job a few months ago, a contract of 450 euros for 40 hours a month delivering pizzas. It means he is no longer considered unemployed, but it is not enough to live without aid from the state. There are more than 10 million people like me living in difficult situations. Out of 80 million citizens, 10 million poor is a lot. So I don't really believe in the miracle of German employment. I just see that the situation has deteriorated for many people since the reforms of the 2010 agenda and Hartz IV. Labour market reforms in the early 2000s led to an explosion of insecure and part-time jobs. The number of working poor has doubled since then, and their situation is often very changeable. We meet Richard in this food aid centre. He is an educator. He comes here between two jobs. Sausages, meat and cheese. Thanks to food aid, Richard saves around 40 euros per week. As he doesn't have any savings, it's a big help. One in ten workers in Germany is considered poor. The Hans Böckler Foundation, which has close links to trade unions, believes that this unprecedented rise in poverty in Europe is due to pressure on the unemployed to accept every job they are offered. But in such a strong economy, these sorts of jobs should be less common. It is possible to revalorize many of these insecure jobs and this must now be a priority. We found that with the introduction of a minimum wage in particular, some mini-jobs became less attractive to employers and have therefore been replaced by full-time jobs. And yet, the working poor was only a marginal issue in the election campaign. So Thomas has decided to tackle his job insecurity on his own. At the age of 42, he has now gone back to school to train to become a welder. So speaking about the German economy, uh, we have been talking about all these reforms that have happened, transformation in the labour market. However, Germany's economic statistics perhaps are a little bit misleading. Uh, we've got 4% unemployment, which looks great on paper, but incomes have stagnated over the last decade. Uh, Mrs. Christaud Rovol, clearly many people who are in employment under Angela Merkel as Chancellor are not finding uh, that they naturally get a better life from being in work. Most of the people in Germany are happy as the situation is. And I believe it will be a big challenge, regardless of who makes uh, the next government, to keep this situation, to keep the situation that we have a country with a stability, with an economic, uh, with economic power, and with people who, in fact, are happy. It is right that there is a small group, but it is really a small group. Uh, also, if you compare to other uh, dates in uh, uh, the states in Europe, that we have to do something for the small group mm -hmm. which has difficulties, mm -hmm. who uh, doesn't really connect to the situation mm -hmm. uh, in 2007. And does Angela Merkel, do the CDU have ideas on how to help yes. the smaller groups? Because it is yes. always the harder task, isn't it, helping yeah. the minorities? There is, of course, uh, a program and uh, the idea that we have uh, to keep attention uh, to everybody. I personally, that's my really personal view, feel that in uh, the globalized world and in the very technical society in which we are living, it is a challenge to try to mm -hmm. incorporate and uh, to give um, the possibility for the people who maybe are not so bright or mm -hmm. uh, are weaker to really participate in this society. Mm -hmm. And I say this regardless of the party in which you are. That's the big challenge of the future. Well, let's move on to another subject that's been a, a big challenge well, for Germany over the last couple of years, uh, the migration issue. It really has dominated uh, the third term for Angela Merkel. Uh, she seems to have hardened her stance quite significantly from that open door policy of 2015. But Germany is still the most applied to country in Europe for asylum. 
the quota system hasn't worked out. Angela Merkel still facing a lot of unpopularity on this issue. Uh, Mr. von Weizsäcker, if we come to you, uh, what would you see as being the way forward on the migration issue for Germany? Well, I think um, uh, the um, openness that um, was organized together in the Grand Coalition, helping hundreds of thousands of refugees from war-torn Syria, was a great success story for now. Mm -hmm. But for it to finish well, it began well, but for it to finish well, we need a serious change in policies. Mm -hmm. serious change in policies. In what way? And that relates very much to social policies as well as other things. One of the great success stories of the Grand Coalition was the minimum wage, which was an initiative of the Social Democrats, and we managed, we managed to get there. And today, the Christian Democrats are saying, well, it was our idea, which isn't entirely true. It was the Social Democrats that pushed for it. But the central tenet, and that was a conservative tenet of the Christian Democrats' policy, was what they called the Schwarze Null the black zero. Mm -hmm. This wasn't investing in our future, in integration, in edu of, 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 of migrants, in education, in the kind of, interest of infrastructures that an um, economy in the 21st century needs, including digital infrastructure. It was all about balancing the budget ex at, at the expense of investing in the future and at the expense of doing, namely what you said, helping people who are otherwise being left behind. And unfortunately, that's a particular challenge for migration. If we don't do that well, it's un afterwards, um, uh, uh, you're going to be sorry about it. And that's one of the reasons why this election is so important. Well, if we stay with the migration issue, we also at the same time have the Alternative für Deutschland party, uh, the, the far right party, which is really coming up in the polls, skirting around 10% currently. Now, uh, they've campaigned very hard on anti-European issues, but also on the migration issue. They say that uh, a large proportion of these people coming to Germany are Muslims and that this is incompatible with German society. Now, uh, as you said, it's been the CDU and the SPD that have been putting forward the policies so far. During this time, there has been this rising sentiment against migration. Uh, Mrs. Christelle uh, Drovol, if I come to you, uh, this certainly seems to be something that is a preoccupation for many Germans. This issue of integration that we were talking about, is it working? Because there do seem to be a lot of Germans who aren't convinced. Um. The situation of 2015, when uh, all these people who are staying there at our borders cannot be repeated. So we need to have a European solution that's common sense uh, in Germany, that's the first thing. The second thing is that there is, a, of course, a difference between refugees and we have to help the refugees who come uh, from uh, a war situation and who are uh, leaving their country because it's not possible uh, to live there, and people who want to come as migrants to Europe. That's two different uh, categories, and we have to handle them differently. Um, the people um, who come to Germany have the right to have um, a quick decision, mm -hmm. can you stay or can't you stay? To have, uh, have the right to know where can I go, what can I do, what do I have to do to continue my life here. And uh, with the big number of refugees, that was not, only, uh, not always possible to handle it properly mm -hmm. during the first time. Mm -hmm. That's why afterwards the government, but the two parties mm -hmm. uh, made um, a set of rules, how can we cope with the people who come here and who are living here and mm -hmm. staying here? What do we have to do with their families, for example? The idea that um, there is a right movement is in fact um, almost everywhere mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the AfD is far away uh, from uh, the numbers and from the figures from the Front National, for example, or from the Geert Wilders party in the Netherlands. 
Well, if I ask Mr. von Weizsäcker, we don't have much time left, but do you see the Alternative für Deutschland as a, as a, a threat in the next four years? I don't see it as a threat to the extent um, that they will get anywhere near majority. But I do see it as a threat in terms of poisoning our public debate. Because mm -hmm. our public debate needs to be about investing into integration rather than having fancy ideas of simply pretending that the problem will go away because anytime soon the war in Syria will be over and everybody can go back home. I mean, I wish the war in Syria would be over soon, but that's simply unrealistic. So we need to prepare for realistic scenarios and unfortunately, and you can see that in the Netherlands, you can see that in France, and unfortunately, yeah. I fear we will see it in Germany, this sort of right-wing group in Parliament will poison our debates, and that's what I'm worried about. I'm not worried, worried about the mere numbers, and luckily um, they're, they're, they're disputing so much amongst themselves that I don't think they'll get a terribly good result, but unfortunately probably good enough to make into Parliament anyway. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for for this part of the programme. But thank you so much uh, for taking us through some of those big themes of the German election on September 24th, as we've said. Thanks so much to my guest, uh, Hugo Delive uh, Christian Rovol from the CDU party and Jakob von Weizsäcker from the SPD. Uh, that is it, as I said, for this part of the programme. Do stay with us, though, on Talking Europe. Coming up after the news update, we're going to be at the uh, other European Parliament site in Brussels with Manfred Weber, German MEP and leader of the biggest group in the European Parliament. Reporters, presented by Mark Owen. In Jerusalem, 30% of the population is ultra-Orthodox. They're known as the Haradim, men who fear God. They recognize only one authority, that of the Creator. In Jerusalem, as in many other cities in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox have their own neighborhoods, their own shops and schools but they regularly come into conflict with the authorities. Our reporters went to Jerusalem to investigate these men in black defying the Israeli state. Reporters on France 24 and France24.com.